Vitalik Buterin, you know, when he first announced uh, Ethereum at the you know Florida Bitcoin conference in January 2014, um, you know, he kind of ends with a joke that maybe we're inventing Skynet. And I think there's a sense in which we already have. I'm Tor Bear from Enigma, and welcome to Decentralize This. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Decentralize This presented by Enigma. My name is Tor Bear. I'm the head of growth for Enigma, and today I am speaking with the brilliant Nathan Schneider. Nathan is a journalist and author, as well as a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's written some really interesting books, including one about the Occupy movement and another about God, so he has some experience tackling complex topics. His latest book is called Everything for Everyone, The Radical Tradition That is Shaping the Next Economy, and it focuses on the role of cooperatives in our society as well as in our future. As a result, Nathan has some very interesting and very relevant ideas about decentralization as a movement and also as a term, and he recently wrote a piece titled What to Do Once You Admit That Decentralizing Everything Never Seems to Work. I think that that's worth talking about. On this episode, Nathan and I are going to discuss platform cooperatism, trust and accountability, the value of privacy, the difference between a protocol and a platform, and also how we should be defining this weird term decentralization, and whether it is a goal in itself or maybe a means to another end. Nathan is an excellent writer. His new book is incredible. The clarity of his ideas is really remarkable. So. I'm very excited to present just some of his thoughts on decentralization and the blockchain space in particular. So without any further introduction, here is Nathan Schneider. Nathan, thank you so much for joining me on Decentralize This. It is a pleasure to be hosting you today. I'm glad to be on. Thanks for having me. We start every podcast the same way, just quickly, personally, professionally. Who is Nathan? What do you care about? Uh, well, it's, it's always a hard a- question to answer quickly. You know, I've written books about uh, debates around the existence of God and about Occupy Wall Street, and now about uh, cooperative business. Um, and uh, and if I have to figure out what connects them all to me, it's it's efforts that people make in different contexts and in different ways to bring their ideals into practice and to uh, bring their kind of highest visions of, of what the good is and what, what um, they seek in life and, and make them work in a, in a messy world. Um, and in particular, lately, I've, I've been drawn to the challenge of democracy and what the future of democracy might look like uh, in a moment where uh, it seems like a lot of our centuries-old institutions are are, are not working the way they're supposed to and maybe never have. Um, how can we, rather than just simply retrenching and defending old institutions, um, uh, actually develop the, the ones that our world really needs? I think that everything that you just said, you know, could not be more timely. You know, this is the right time to be having that conversation. And they're not conversations that started, you know, only in the last few months or years. Like these, as you said, of these have been questions fundamentally about democracy uh, forever. And only now in the last few years, I think what's changed is we've created these new technologies, maybe some of these decentralizing technologies that have given us uh, new opportunities and also opened up a ton of new risks. Uh, I would love to talk with you about all of those things. Um, and of course, the name of this podcast is Decentralize This. Maybe the right place to start is with a, what I think is a difficult question but maybe that's why this is such a difficult space. What is decentralization? Like, what does that word mean? Is it is it even a meaningful word? I'd love your perspective. Well, I've been really interested in the uses of of decentralization, and you know, I, I really spent all of the last summer thinking about this word and exploring its different um, its different references and reference and and um, uh, looking both. Uh, in the very contemporary future looking discourse as well as um, in the, into the past. And um, in particular today in the context of internet networks and and 
blockchain, crypto networks, and uh, especially, um, I think it's come to be what discourse analysts refer to as a floating signifier. You know, it's a it's a term that with a lot of power and importance, um, but it floats in the sense of not having a fixed definition. And you know, lots of words work like this way. This is not a, a, a terribly unusual thing, except uh, that it's kind of striking how commonly it's used um, in a way that doesn't necessarily um, uh, map on to other ways that it's used. People are using it in different ways and putting a lot of importance on it. Um, expecting a lot from this from this word. Um, you know, we could also, I, I think in, in, in that way, it's kind of akin to uh, how people in startup culture, Silicon Valley have used disrupt, right? There is a kind of academic definition like Clayton Christensen's analysis of disruptive innovation. Um, but usually when people use the word disrupt in startup culture, um, they're not necessarily referring to that. They're referring to this kind of broader cultural uh, uh, sense of what they're trying to accomplish and uh, and the performance of using the word is as important as, in a sense, its literal meaning. And I think disruption has, uh, or sorry, decentralization has taken on that kind of role. Um, and yeah. and that, that, that performativity of it is really interesting. Let me try to pick a concrete example that's come up recently on, on even this podcast. You know, it is something like Twitter, a decentralized network because on the one hand and again like i know that it's a floating signifier i i know that you know even if you and i agree on a definition someone else might not but let's explore it with twitter anybody can register for twitter anybody can have a voice on a platform like twitter you know it's decentralized in the sense that there's not one or or so we think there's not one person making decisions about who can say what you know it, it's not the same as the cable news uh network uh, but on the other hand, obviously, there's parts of Twitter that are extremely centralized and there's shadow bans and, and there's, you know, huge issues of like, is, is the person I'm interacting with on Twitter even real? Who who gets to make that determination? You know, to, to what extent is something like Twitter, for example, decentralized? How should we think about it? Well, it's, a, it's a great question. And and it, it kind of forces us to specify, as you just did there, what is being decentralized? Because what what I keep noticing over and over is that whenever um, somebody introduces a decentralizing system into um, you know into the world, it often creates a kind of backdoor centralization process, and that's that's really important. And and I think it's it's kind of um, uh, not going to go away. I think this there's something tied up. Uh, in this dynamic between decentralization and centralization. So for instance, with Twitter, you have, yeah, this decentralization of access and opportunity um, where more people can participate in more ways in, in, a, uh, in a discourse, but you have the cost maybe or the, the, um, uh, the, same, the, the, the contemporary phenomenon at the same time where um, suddenly the platform of of public engagement of the public sphere is more centralized, right? It's all happening on Twitter. You're either on Twitter or you don't exist in certain circles, right? right. And uh, we see that recur, and that that goes back a long time into actually other uses of decentralization. You know, for um, uh, since you know the in the latter half of the 20th century in development discourse and political science, uh, decentralization was very. Uh, uh, widely promoted as a, you know, as a mechanism of political uh, system reform, you know, m making these systems less, you know, kind of federally centralized and more distributed across uh, regions and so forth, allowing for more local control. And even in that context, as scholars and, and development professionals tried to really um, define what they meant by decentralization, they realized that over and over, whenever you create decentralization in one area, um, it appears to to show up in new ways. You know, you you decentralize uh, 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 government authority to more local areas, and maybe you know large corporations are able to have more power, and they're able to centralize their power, and there's no you know government. Uh, authority strong enough to counteract them, or it might em embolden warlords or something like that. Uh, this kind of pattern has recurred. And, and so it's made me interested in how maybe when we talk about decentralization, we need to be much more 
uh, willing to also talk about how we're going to deal with whatever centralization occurs at the same time. Yeah, in the recent episode we had with Anthony Pompliano, uh, he came on and he basically said, you know, as much as you can be like this anarchistically minded libertarian uh, entrepreneur, eventually if you defeat the man, you become the man, right? And and we're seeing what happens. You know, you, you can be very high minded, you can have these ideals, but if the system that you're working within is is not really rewarding you at that point for keeping your ideals, there's always going to be this pressure to compromise those ideals. And as you said, if if decentralization, I guess, at least to me is like, you're breaking things back down, you're taking these like, these rules or, or systems that have hardened, and you're making them a little softer, and you're rearranging the pieces, well, just rearranging them, you know, it doesn't mean they're not going to reharden, and and it doesn't mean that you're not going to end up with these, uh, you know, these centralized systems where these things have hardened into larger entities. I, I think what you're cautioning is is really important. That like it's not just enough to break things down. We have to think very coherently. How are we going to reassemble the parts? It's not enough to just break things. We have to fix it. Absolutely. And and I, I think that's a real opportunity, too. I mean, when you break things apart and create spaces where people have more, for instance, points of access to a system or a discourse or an economy, um, you know, you really can use that opportunity to um, improve how the more centralized features of that system work. For instance, mm-hmm. you know, a couple of years ago, I was involved in an effort to um, uh, uh, to to get Twitter to sell to its users, to have meaningful user ownership in the company. Um, and, you know, we got a shareholder proposal in at the company's annual meeting and all this stuff. We had a nice little campaign. Um, but it, it, um, uh, it just highlights the possibility, like, okay, if you're going to have a centralized element to this system that is defining the rules and deciding what's done with all the data and so forth, like, we could design that in a way where it's accountable in an appropriate and effective way, right? So that you get, it's a win-win. You get the decentralization at one end of the network and where centralization is useful and necessary, it's at least accountable. Um, But what has happened in so many spaces where people talk about decentralization, they focus so much on what they're decentralizing that they don't even think about or want to think about what they're actually centralizing. And so you end up with like highly regressive structures. So like when you look at, your average open source project where participation is very decentralized, you know, you end up often with these like, you know, the joke is or the, you know, the the official term, right, the benevolent dictators for life, like, Mm -hmm. how are we back at that? You know, how are we back? How how is this like democratizing internet, like reinventing monarchy? And, (laughs) um, and, uh, uh, you know, what if we Jack Dorsey, benevolent philosopher king? Yeah, or or Linus Torvalds or or um, Vitalik Buterin, you know, I, I mean, the role of Vitalik Buterin and his charismatic authority in shaping the Ethereum uh, uh, community is, sure. you know, is is astonishing. Well, not all um, of that, of course, he wished upon himself. I don't I don't think he no, self identified no. as a charismatic leader, but he's been endowed with, with Absol- that responsibility. Absolutely. Precisely because so much emphasis is, was put on what are we decentralizing? And there was almost this um, anxiety about like reinventing, you know, <laughs> kind of traditional bureaucratic, you know, accountability structures or, or Republican accountability structures. You know, I think sometimes two people are so focused on what's new that they um, are, are, are uh, losing sight of you know, some some useful um, uh, liberal democratic uh, structures that might actually um, help these these centralized features start to become more accountable. So I, I want to present you with a quote of yours because we're talking about it already. I, I read some of your work where you wrote, we should care less about whether something is centralized or decentralized than whether it is accountable, right? Now, now we're talking about this idea of accountability and this idea that decentralization itself is maybe not an end goal, right? And like, I would say like, finding a use for blockchain is not the goal of a company in this space, right? It's a tool. But what we're looking for is solutions to problems. And if the problem is accountability, we need to be creating systems that solve that problem of accountability. And in this way, you know, 
blockchain can help reestablish, you know, trust and transparency in some areas. In other ways, it's not going to be as effective. And I think what, another point you make is that like an accountable system can have consistent rules, uh, but then the rules can change. Let's let's talk about this for a second because. One of the issues we see in the decentralization space or blockchain space is you can set up a smart contract and a smart contract has rules. That's the whole idea. And that's great. You know, it, it can be programmatically enforced. What happens if the rules need to change? You know, whose responsibility is it to to change the rules of, of a smart contract so that it's better serving the, the needs of the users of a network? So it's a really great question, and and um, you know my my I have a colleague here in the business school at CU Boulder, uh, Eric Alston, who is uh, a, a constitutional scholar, mm -hmm. uh, works with countries developing and adapting their constitutions, and is actually looking at these questions in blockchain land uh, uh, through that experience. You know, looking at the relationship between how countries have changed their underlying rules and how these systems are looking to do that. I, you know, I think we're, we're starting to get into some pretty scary territory where um, it's very, very hard for people to change rules or, uh, or the rules, uh, uh, the, the decision-making process is dominated by people with a pretty, um, uh, uh, you know, less than ideal incentive structure, you know, so where you have, you know, Bitcoin miners and their power in the system, right. you have um, these, these structures in which you um, uh, in which the rules for changing the rules um, are a little distressing, and they create um, a kind of uh, self, uh, uh, kind of self-perpetuating beast. I mean, I, you know, Vitalik Buterin, you know, when he first announced uh, Ethereum at the you know Florida Bitcoin conference in January 2014, um, you know, he kind of ends with a joke that maybe we're inventing Skynet, and I think there's a sense in which we already have. I mean, you know, there's no turning back when you're, you know, when people have billions of dollars invested in Bitcoin um, and like they, you know, there's no way out if you start deciding that, um, uh, you know, that the, that the environmental consequences of the proof of work system are just untenable or something like that. You're, you're so incentivized in the system that, you know, it's kind of inescapable. And, and I think we're approaching that kind of moment in, in more ways than we realize. And, and I, you know, that's why I think accountability is important. You know, we, we want to create systems, I hope, that are more responsive, um, that have better feedback loops, um, that are more able to um, uh, attend to the needs that human beings recognize for themselves and that they generate collectively, mm -hmm. um, rather than creating an environment where we're essentially serving the systems we've created. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what we've gotten to in many ways with the conventional uh, economic system. And, and I worry that automating so many of these processes is actually accelerating that uh, lack of control, uh, uh, lack of volition, uh, and lack of accountability uh, for our economic systems. Um, uh, uh, and and we're, we're only intensify, intensifying that feature. So I, I want to pick on this word volition, right? You know, and, and this idea of choice, the choice of whom you trust. I think I see the value of decentralized systems as giving people a choice uh, in who is trusted within these systems and networks. And right now, I don't really, if you, like you said, like if I can only be a person, if I can only be uh, somebody with a digital identity, if I'm on Twitter, I have to trust Twitter to some extent. Like I, I don't have a choice but to use Twitter or let's say Facebook, right? Like these are not choices that are given to me as a consumer if as a society we sort of mandate participation. I see decentralized alternatives as just changing the nature of who you trust. And, and I agree with you when you say I'm not sure we can ever avoid certain elements of these new systems becoming centralized. But isn't it at least beneficial to say that like now we might have a choice on who to trust within these networks that isn't a corporation, a traditional corporation. Yeah, and and it's why I think you know in general the reason I'm interested in decentralization as a topic is I'm highly sympathetic to the you know to the motives and to the structures um, uh, underlying this, and and I think um, creating more diversity of opportunity and a diversity of of trust in our networks is. 
um, you know, would be on the whole a good thing. Um, you know, for instance, uh, uh, one experience of trust I've, I've enjoyed is that I'm a member of a, um, a web hosting co-op called May 1st. Um, it's a, you know, democratic, uh, nonprofit organization. And, and it's, um, it's really interesting because, uh, you know, I use my, use it for email and calendars and contacts and, uh, file sharing and, you know, as well as web hosting and, and, um, all using open source software, you know, all connected to the big internet. Um, but my interface with all of those larger networks is through, you know, a, a, an organization that's run by like three people. Um, and, you know, I can call them up or, you know, uh, email them whenever I like They're, You know, I, I know them personally. Um, you know, we have conversations about things beyond just our technology. And so I really enjoy being able to have that relationship happen through that kind of direct trust relationship. Um, it's just a different, it's a different experience than, you know, tr you know, try calling up whoever's maintaining your Google service. Right. Um, it, you know, and it's nice to be able to choose among these different levels and, and, and so forth. But I, 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 I um, uh, you know, I, th I think we run into a model in particular, um, when we're looking at the financing structures that are pushing um, a lot of the technologies that we're building, mm -hmm. um, there's there's a lot of interest in decentralization and a lot of talk about it. But when you look at the underlying economies that are motivating it, they're not moving toward the thing I just described. That experience of like you know building a trust relationship over years and and operating on that basis. They're actually the underlying ec economics. Um, uh, in both the crypto world and in the non-crypto world actually organizes toward um, a kind of monopoly model. You know, venture capital is, is uh, uh, very, very much designed to create as close as you can get to a monopoly as quickly as possible, you know, because mm -hmm. that's, that's how you get your 10x return that pays for all the risk. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's, it's cool because it enables people to take risks and get a lot of money to do it. But um, it's also troubling as some of those risks pay off and start maturing, and suddenly we find some of our major uh, utility systems uh, 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 providing these somewhat decentralized systems with a rapacious appetite for centralization. And the same thing is is playing out in in cryptocurrency. I th I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens after the current market correction. Um, I suspect we're going to see, because of various network effect, you know, phenomena, as well as some of the venture capital type behavior that is entering the space in a big way, that we're going to see um, uh, a repeat of some of those centralization practices, but even more pernicious, perhaps, because now we're talking not just about platforms, we're talking about protocols. And that's a big difference. Uh, before, you know, you, you just can't underestimate the significance of the fact that, you know, the major internet protocols were developed as open tools by participatory organizations like the WC3 um, and, um, and, and others. Um, we're, we're moving into a space where the protocols themselves um, appear uh, uh, to be leaning toward becoming highly privatized and, and, and highly centralized as such. It's it's very early, right? Like it's so hard to try to model these complex Absolutely. systems and see oh how God. this is all going to turn out. And of course, the one way to be sure that somebody uh, doesn't really know what they're talking about is to see how certain they are uh, in, in this space in particular. Like as soon as I hear somebody express a prediction with 100% confidence, then I, I sort of tune it out because we know that where things go very much depends on the regulatory environment depends yeah. on you know the the willingness of current participants like miners and developers to continue participating because the reality is you know we're building a parallel universe right now everybody's got another option uh, a bitcoin miner could be using that electricity for something else uh, a developer could be working for google and somebody like yourself doesn't have to be writing about blockchain as it pertains to decentralization like and I think we should talk about this now. Like, you're, and when you write about this stuff, you're not just writing about decentralization as like a blockchain movement, right? Like, you're talking about uh, the cooperative movement, and and mm -hmm. I want to ask you about that because a lot of the listeners on this podcast are going to be much more familiar with blockchain than they might yeah. be about uh, co-ops 
or, or platform co-ops. Can you talk a bit about what those are, how they relate to what's going on in like the blockchain space specifically right now, and like what one could be learning from the other? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's uh, this is you know really, really passion for me now, and and it's um, you know it, it comes out of seeing the ways in which you know we have such short memory and uh, we lose track of lessons that um, have been learned in previous economies. Um, so a cooperative business is is a kind of business that's owned and governed to some degree by the people who participate in it, rather than those who are. Um, primarily involved for kind of short-term financial uh, gain and who may be outsiders entirely. Um, so some cooperatives have been owned by their workers. Um, uh, some have been owned by uh, uh, consumers, like here in the United States, uh, two of the major kinds of consumer cooperatives are uh, electric companies in rural areas that are owned by their rate payers or um, credit unions that about a third of uh, Americans are members of that are um, Uh, owned by the people who deposit money there. Um, And uh, some of them, many of them, many of the most powerful ones are actually business to business co-ops. So they allow small businesses to have economies of scale, like um, hardware stores that are members of um, Ace Hardware, that's a cooperative. So they're able to act as if they get the same like low prices uh, on wholesale as a a national chain, but they remain their independence as local stores. Uh, retain their independence as local stores. And um, uh, so so it's a model that can take a lot of different forms. Um, some of them are small and very high touch and you know consensus based. Some are very large and look on a day to day level a lot like other kinds of large businesses. and um, and I, you know i I and a number of others around the world in recent years have been getting involved in this idea of platform cooperativism. How do we bring mm. um, this this history of accountable business, democratic business, into the platform economy, and then also into the protocol economy, and and um, uh, and so you know I work with startups of many sorts that are doing this sort of thing. We, we're just launching our first um, co-op accelerator uh, called Start Co-op. We just got a a grant from Google for a million dollars to do some development uh, internationally through uh, platform co-ops and. Um, uh, and then also we have some uh, projects in the blockchain space, like um, our chain is actually organized as a as a co-op, um, and then uh, also not quite blockchain, but um, the Holochain project is very much interested in in being a kind of uh, protocol for co-op development. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to use this kind of uh, this legacy of of cooperative business to uh, address some of these accountability problems. Uh, that we're finding when the recentralization happens, uh, that this is a, a structure for for building democracy into economies where um, some kind of centralization needs to happen, but in a way that ensures, um, unlike uh, invis- investor-driven businesses typically, uh, that the business is ultimately accountable uh, downward to the grassroots, to the participants, uh, rather than upward to um, uh, 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 investors seeking to extract profit at all costs. So let me ask you something, you know, like you, you're talking about learning from history and not having such a short memory. If we are, are going to be learning something from, from the cooperative movement, like what are the risks that we should be watching out for? Like where, where have cooperative movements failed and, and how might like these new technologies help us fix those previous failures and, and maybe succeed where cooperative movements have historically fallen short? Well, you know, they've fallen short in all sorts of ways, like any, any kind of business. Um, uh, I, I think one major piece of it is, um, uh, is, is retaining their, uh, the kind of liveliness and, and uh, vigor in the um, relationship among members. Uh, so a lot of times, cooperative startup with a strong sense of kind of social value and, and solidarity and so forth. And then uh, two generations later, they, you know, they're, they're operating as much like, you know, a, a, any other kind of business as they possibly can. And they're not really reaping the potential benefits of that kind of um, energy and solidarity. Mm-hmm. And um, I think new technologies uh, uh, offer a lot of opportunities for members to, 
um, retain that sense of, of mutual connection, not just connection through the organization. Um, another feature is, um, you know, is the ability to develop financing. You know, co-ops were really the original crowdfunding. Um, and, uh, you know, when, for instance, REI, the, you know, outdoor goods uh, uh, retailer, you know, started as a cooperative because um, a group of people in Seattle wanted to buy this really nice German ice axe, you know, and they, and they like, the obvious way to do it was to pool their money in a cooperative and, um, uh, and, and build on that basis. Um, and the nice thing about this model is unlike Kickstarter, you know, there was actually accountability built in to the people who contributed um, because they were owners of the enterprise. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we have a, an opportunity when we look at trying to develop the next generation of crowdfunding to democratize finance, um, to do it through these structures that um, build accountability and democracy into the um, into the model, um, and 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 allow us to be kind of fuller selves in in the process rather than just participating as consumers and customers and so and so forth. Um, and 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 so I, I you know I'm very when I first for instance learned about the Ethereum protocol you know in the in January of 2014 you know right after this white paper came out. Um, I, I was very excited. I'd never been interested in Bitcoin very much, but the idea of smart contracts and, and, and so forth, um, you know, immediately suggested to me, wow, this is the basis upon which we could be building the next generation of democracy. You know, this is the next, this is the way we could be, um, experimenting much more rapidly than, than government structures allow because they're, they're just so big and inflexible. Mm -hmm. Now we can build our democracies, you know, on the fly. But then, you know, it was striking to see what happens, like so much of the institutional design, so to speak, um, going into blockchain projects has been so driven by an economic model. Right. Um, you know, it's been so driven by this kind of Hayekian incentive game theory um, calculation that it's it's um, spoken to our us as, um, you know, as as merely financial actors and it doesn't allow our kind of full humanity to come into the projects um, in a way that I think uh, 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 could happen if our uh, if our designs were attentive not only to economics but to um, the kind of uh, uh, the the habits of uh, of democracies. So we started running into this idea of accountability again, right? Just there, and I want to distinguish it from something else, which is transparency. Right. You agree there's two different concepts. Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, it's not purely semantics to be able to say that, like, while we want these organizations and systems to be accountable, uh, it's not so much about, like, necessarily making everything public to everyone. And this is something now that's that's getting very personal for me and my work with Enigma and, and thinking about the role of privacy in these systems, because the way that the way that I believe privacy works is that it's a fundamental human right. And it actually protects our rights as individuals and as participants in these systems. And when it's removed or when it's not solved for, you do run the risk of something like, say, surveillance capitalism taking over the entire system. What do you see as the role of you know, privacy in shaping the, the future of these protocols or these systems? Like, do, do you agree with me that there's some role that that's going to play? Or do you think that privacy is actually hurting our ability to create accountable systems? Um, I, I think, it, you know, privacy is always a calculation and it's a social calculation. Um, you know, I, I think we, we tend to kind of technologize these things um, maybe more than we should. You know, I, I think it's useful that there are certain technological tools that enable us to, you know, encrypt communications and things like that. I'm, I, and I'm very active in using those sorts of tools. Um, you know, I, I, when I was working mainly as a reporter, it was really necessary given the kinds of subjects I was covering. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think those tools are important. Um, but, you know, when we look at what privacy has meant in, you know, again, before this moment, um, uh, you know, th imagine a locked door. Um, a locked door is a social contract. It's a piece of technology, but it's a piece of social technology. Um, you know, you can always break through a locked door, pretty much any locked door, except maybe a, you know, a bank vault in Switzerland. 
Um, and even that, there's some way in. Um, you know, a, what a locked door signifies is I'm going to introduce a little bit of difficulty to this scenario that helps remind us all that we've all agreed not to like walk into each other's houses without asking, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's partly technological, but it's partly social. Um, and uh, and it's a signifier. And, and I think we need to recognize that when we build these systems. And that's why, you know, privacy is always a set of compromises. Like you want a locked door, you know, to, to broadcast that idea of please don't come into my house. Um, but at some level, you know, even somebody who believes that probably wants their door to be, um, you know, able to be busted down in case there's a fire and their kid is sleeping inside and the firefighters need to get in. Right. right. You know, there's a there's there are moments always where, you know, decisions need to be made about when the rules need to be suspended. And to me, the most important thing is how do we make sure that when the rules are suspended, it's done in our best interests rather than against our best interests. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that's why I'm, w when I think about privacy, I'm really interested in models, not that make everything private permanently forever all the time, but that make sure that when decisions need to be made, they're being made in our best interests. Um, and they're being made, you know, in ways that we would want to make them. So, you know, how can we make sure that, you know, if somebody's going to be holding our data and making those decisions about when and how to use it, that the people whose data is involved are in that conversation. Um, how do you make sure that, you know, for instance, a, a platform co-op that, you know, I've worked with some is called MeData and it works with medical data. It's in, out of Switzerland. And their idea is, you know, look, we want to use this data, share it with researchers, make it available. But in order to ensure that we're not, you know, have no temptation to be jerks about it, this company is going to be owned by the people whose data is in there. Mm -hmm. And that to, to me seems like um, an important addition to the technological capacity for privacy. We need social infrastructure that supports the appropriate, um, uh, helps us draw the appropriate lines between privacy and, um, and, 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 and the kind of necessary exposure uh, uh, that, you know, I think on some level, a common good requires. Now we're touching on something else, which is also the difference between like data privacy, which is which is what I mostly care about, right? And, and then also this idea of anonymity, because anonymity is not associated with accountability. When when people talk about privacy normally, I think they're thinking about like the fact that like somebody who cares about privacy is somebody who doesn't want other people to know who they are, usually to escape some kind of accountability. So they associate privacy with criminals, or at least, you know, it's beneficial to to the narrative for, for certain centralized authorities to say, well, if you have nothing to hide, why are you hiding something? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's a very dangerous narrative to encourage, right? Like, so how do we how do we get people to appreciate what you're saying, where it's like, okay, privacy is about including people in the conversation whose whose data is being used and consumed. The people who these systems are supposed to protect and involve and hopefully hopefully give them a stake, uh, not just in, you know, a stake in the outcome and a stake in the say, but like a meaningful stake in the return of such a of such an organization or such a system. Like how how do we make those people understand that it, this is about their privacy, not protecting the anonymity of criminals? Like it, it's easy to get confused. Yeah, and 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 again, that's where I think the kind of um, you know, gray area decision making is necessary, you know, human decision making is necessary. There isn't a system that can solve these problems for us. I mean, anonymity, you know, can be used for ill, but it can be really important. It can be really important for, you know, for people to express identities that are not popular. It can be important for, you know, expressing opinions or um, uh, whistleblowing on, on yeah. structures that are so powerful that they um, would crush any identity that they're able to uh, recognize. Um, the, the anonymity certainly has its uses in all sorts of ways. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, the big question is, is, you know, how can we make sure that, that um, these, you know, privacy and anonymity are possible, um, but that we're able to make kind of social decisions about um, when we're going to, 
you know, when we're going to flip the switch on the, uh, on them. And, and I think it is a social question. And, you know, it doesn't have to be something that we all have to agree on together. We can have different overlapping systems. That's, you know, generally how um, even, you know, liberal democracies have tended to function where you have, you know, local and national systems overlapping. You have things like, you know, you have the balance of powers in the federal government. You have these overlapping systems that allow people different points of input into the 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 environment and that, and that's another thing to really to really recognize is that is that the kind of traditional liberal system for um for addressing uh um addressing the different capacities and needs of people is that you have different uh you have you enable your systems to um value people in different ways um so you know somebody in in Wyoming is more valuable in the Senate Somebody in New York City is more valuable in, um, you know, is, has more voice in in the House of Representatives. Um, if you look at, um, uh, and, and I'm starting to see this emerging in the design of blockchain systems. So, you know, we have governance models starting to emerge where, uh, for instance, reputation and stake mm -hmm. are are both have a role in the system, yeah. right? Um, where, where different aspects of a per, of a of a user's identity allow them different amounts of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, input into, into uh, how things proceed. And, and I think we want more and more of that. We want, we, we want not just one system that determines our value as such and, and leave it at that, but we want to create overlapping systems that enable us to, um, to kind of weigh different forms of value against each other. And, and you know, one example of that, for instance, could be, um, in a system that is heavily stake weighted, you know, where people with more money in the system or more, you know, mining power in the system are powerful. Maybe that system also needs a kind of one person, one vote type of uh, structure that allows for some kind of response to that, a kind of house of commons to that house of lords. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, and, and there are reasons why, you know, governments in the past have built those kinds of the counteracting forces into their structures um, because it actually creates more efficient feedback loops. Um, and, 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 and I think we need to start recognizing uh, the efficiency of democracy. Um, a de democracy is a tool of efficiency and of, um, and of uh, a kind of optimality. Um, whereas in a lot of the blockchain discourse, I see this, this interest in trying to escape politics in trying to ev avoid what people perceive as the inefficiency of democracy right. um, without, without appreciating the fact that, you know, the reason why, you know, the most successful societies in our, in our world, you know, maybe up until recently have been, you know, those that are democratic is that this is actually a very effective way of, you know, managing the distribution of, of political energy and resources. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think we need to, we need to, uh, uh, you know, recognize that and recognize that there are serious inefficiencies in allowing a measure of value so narrow as a cur currency measurement uh, to determine uh, uh, what should be done in our world. So many of the most important systems in our world from, you know, the highways to the, um, you know, the GPS system, others, you know, would not have been built by private capital alone. They're, they're public choices, they're public decisions. Yeah, I mean, we can we can talk at length, I'm sure, about you know to what extent democracy is is still an effective model, at least in the United States, and to what extent it has been compromised by people who have tried to shift these systems over long periods of time to suit their own interests. And you know, there's a good argument that somebody in Wyoming. You know, shouldn't be as represent like two two representatives in the Senate for Wyoming, two representatives for California in the Senate. Does that is that really you know one person one vote at that point no. in a representative <laughs> democracy? Of course not. Is that ever yeah, going and, to change? And, how, and that, how how would we even change that? Well, that it's a great question. You know, and and that's you know the the as at least for uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, the, the U.S. Constitution was written with the assumption that this would be significantly changed in any, in any given generation. And I think the promise of some of these new technologies is that maybe now we actually can iterate faster on our, on our democratic institutions. We can, we can experiment, allow the best solutions to, uh, to advance 
and to grow and and that the uh, friction, so to speak, of of changing systems might be reduced. That to me, that's where the optimist gets in me gets really excited. That this right. is an opportunity to really supercharge our institutional imaginations. Um, on the one hand, I've been really you know again disheartened by the way in which so much of the so many of the projects in the space have been kind of um, embracing this very narrow economic logic at the mm. expense of a democratic logic. At the same time, I think in this moment of market correction, um, I, I, I see some signs, and I, this is something that I'm going to be um, diving into more deeply in the coming months, some signs that actually as projects mature, they're starting to realize the need for these kinds of more democratic structures uh, to counteract the, um, you know, the, really the poor feedback loops of, of um, uh, merely economic structures. And that to me is, is you know, very exciting that we may, um, through these systems, be able to develop uh, you know, the, next, um, uh, uh, the next advances on democracy rather than, um, you know, unfortunately, doing away with with the the very idea that you know people should uh, have a say in their world, regardless of whether or not they happen to hold a lot of whatever cash is considered valuable at the time. So I'll, I'll leave you with this with this question, right? Like I want to get your take on this. Um, let's say you're facing a room, like you're giving the keynote speech to a room full of builders of these uh, decentralized blockchain based systems, and let's leave out the people, let's say, who have, you know, by design created systems that they know are, you know, failing at accountability. Like we, we leave out people who are deliberately creating scams and Ponzi's. But let's say you're oh. you're addressing a room of well-meaning, you know, ethical people who just maybe don't know how to consider the problems that you're laying out here fully because, you know, they're maybe they're very young. Many of them are. Uh, maybe they haven't spent as much time researching this stuff. I'm sure that they haven't. Obviously, this is you're, you're one of the most knowledgeable people on this topic in, in the world, I'm sure, at this point. So you're standing on stage. If you only have like a minute or two, what do you want them to take away from you that you think would be most critical for them to know when they're going out and building these systems and, and breaking stuff and fixing stuff? Like what, what should they take away? What what can they hold on to? <laughs> well, I, I've been in that situation. I and figured as much. One thing I like I like to to say is, you know, I'm for now I'm sticking with the Federal Reserve, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, and I did that on stage with Joseph Lubin, you know, the theory of consensus, and he said, "I'm with you." <laughs> um, and and what I mean by that is is not that I think the Federal Reserve is great. I think it's a you know really pretty terribly designed institution in a lot of ways. Yet it still has. Um, uh, the semblance of more democratic uh, accountability than a lot of uh, the the blockchain systems I've seen so far. Um, it has enough levers that are controlled by uh, uh, the popular will um, for the for the common good than a lot of blockchain systems are building into themselves, and uh, or that people are building into them. And so my challenge in rooms like that is let's at least do better than the Federal Reserve. <laughs> you know, let's at least build more democracy into the systems we're creating than the previous generations have figured out. You know, let's at least like not head straight back to monarchy, <laughs> you know, awesome. um, and and um, and I think we can do that. These tools can enable us to, to really build that next generation of democracy. But we have to recognize that that's our challenge, um, uh, uh, not merely to uh, dispense with all systems that preceded them, and imagine that um, the kind of uh, uh, you know ruthless economic uh, uh, greed-seeking uh, 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 incentive structures, which you know have already created a lot of problems in our world, um, are going to be sufficient. Uh, that we should build on um, the the, um, the the best parts of uh, of our uh, pseudo democratic institutions, rather than simply dispensing with them. Uh, and and uh, and in doing that, there's a huge set of opportunities. Um, you know, there there are uh, ideas about you know liquid democracy of of, of uh, reinventing sortition. You know, jury systems of of um, you know using uh, a kind of blend of democratic and and economic systems like quadratic voting. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole range of institutional strategies that 
um, haven't really been explored simply because our our government systems are too inflexible to do it. Now we have the technology to really iterate uh, as we never have been before. Let's not lose that chance. I think it's an incredible call to action. And I I think you've given listeners a lot to think about. So if they want to continue reading about this stuff, learning about this stuff, where where can they find more of your work? I know you've got this book now. Where where should they go to keep learning about this stuff? And and me too. I mean, I'm just going to eat it all up. You know that. Absolutely. Well, um, so my my latest book is called Everything for Everyone, uh, the radical tradition that is shaping the next economy. It's all about this cooperative tradition. It's got you know a good chunk on on blockchain stuff as well. Um, on platform cooperativism, uh, I and and Trevor Schultz, uh, who coined the term, um, edited a book called Ours to Hack and to Own. Uh, that's a collection of essays on on the platform co op um, idea. And you can follow up as well at um, platform.coop or the Internet of Ownership, ioo.coop, which is a directory of, of the platform co-op ecosystem. And it has some uh, uh, links for how to you know, join our mailing lists and things like that. Uh, so you know, I really would love to see more participation among people working in, in, in these uh, uh, you know, crypto network technologies. We've already got a lot of folks doing it. Um, in, in our community, but uh, we'd love to have more and love to help, um, you know, connect this old tradition of, of democratic uh, uh, enterprise with this tremendous new opportunity to build the, the networks of the future. Well, as you're saying, I, I don't think it's possible to ignore these very old issues, even in a very new space. So I do encourage everybody, I'll put the links in the episode description. I encourage everybody to follow up on all these amazing resources. And Nathan, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Best of luck to you. And uh, let me know what you're working on next. Whenever it comes out, I'll be there. All right. Sure thing. Thanks so much for for, uh, taking the time and asking questions. Of course. Thank you.